Section one of the Mary Frances Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dolman. The Mary Frances Storybook by Jane Eyre Fryer. The Trip to Storyland on the Shore if only whispered mary frances to herself as she closed the book she had been reading if only one could find the enchanted island and the hidden treasure of stories i wish i wish the story told how to get there she was sitting on the branches of a tree which were so bent that they formed sort of a hammocky rocking chair the tree was close to the bank of the river and away in the distance the white caps of the ocean rolled up and broke upon the beach it's quite a journey said a small voice quite a long journey mary frances looked all around but could not find where the voice came from you see it's out at sea continued the voice and only one boat and one passenger a year what's more this last was uttered with a deep sigh why where are you who are you asked mary frances springing up here i am but i won't be long continued the voice you'd better look lively for i can't cling to this fence much longer besides i'm almost out of element then the little girl saw a dolphin sitting on the top rail of the fence holding on with one fin oh she cried do you really know where the enchanted island is will you tell me how to get there that i will said the dolphin that i will if you'll give me a little of my element first what is that asked mary frances why you couldn't live without yours for one minute i'll die if i don't get some soon oh dear what can it be whatever in the world is your element i don't want you to die be quick cried the dolphin fanning himself with the other fin i feel very faint i'll get some water stooping quickly mary frances filled her hat before she could dash it over him the dolphin ducked his head into the hat full of water thank you he said raising his head you're not so dull after all water is my element air is yours of course said mary frances but she wondered why the dolphin didn't jump back into the water the reason is that it takes me so long to climb a fence Oh said mary frances although she didn't see why the dolphin had to sit on a fence to talk so that there'll be no offence said the dolphin after staring at her for a while but to refer to the trip have you a ticket why no i don't think i have mary frances searched in her pockets and pulled out some ribbon a doll's wig a thimble and a piece of paper that's the ticket exclaimed the dolphin pointing with his fin all you need to do is sign it have you a pencil mary frances searched again in her pockets while the dolphin looked on anxiously but couldn't find one well never mind just pull out one of my whiskers he said it will write right well but i might hurt you cried mary frances not if you take that loose one he said pointing with his fin very gently mary frances pulled it and out it came sign your name cried the dolphin excitedly right at the end of the paper excuse me said mary frances my father says that no one should ever sign a paper without reading it that's good reading said the dolphin read it and mary frances read good for one first-class passage to story island i believe in all good fairies signed blank number one million two hundred thirty four thousand five hundred sixty seven of course i'll sign that said mary frances gravely using the dolphin's whisker at that the dolphin fell over with a great splash into the water oh screamed mary frances you'll be drowned but just at that moment up came the dolphin's head out of the water my element he said then mary frances laughed to think how soon she had forgotten hold your ticket and wait right where you are 
the dolphin called out swimming away mary frances watched the splashing tail and shining back flashing in the sun two or three times he leaped playfully in the air turned somersaults in the water and then disappeared from sight into the little cove near the mouth of the river end of section one section two of the mary frances storybook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jennifer dolman the mary frances storybook by jane eyre fryer the good fairy puts out to sea oh my thought mary frances oh my i hope he won't forget after a little while she caught sight of the dolphin swimming around the little high peninsula on one side of the cove he seemed to be piloting something for every few seconds he would leap up and look around as if to make sure that everything was as it should be soon mary frances saw a beautiful little sailboat rounding the point surely it was following the dolphin as it drew nearer she could read the name in gold letters on the prow the good fairy a brisk wind filled the white sails and brought the boat so swiftly up the river that the dolphin had to swim with all his might to keep ahead as she came to anchor in the shallow water near the bank the dolphin called out have you your ticket yes said mary frances holding it up to view then step on my back and jump aboard said the dolphin as mary frances placed her foot on the dolphin as on a bridge he suddenly arched his back and tossed her aboard take plenty of time to look the ship over he called out and don't lose your ticket then the dolphin with the good fairy following in his wake swam down the river and put out to sea the good fairy was a charming little boat graceful in every line it wasn't any longer than a large rowboat but it seemed to have every comfort provided there was on deck a comfortable deck chair upon it was spread a beautiful steamer rug i'll take a nice nap after i look the boat over thought mary frances as she made her way into the cabin she uttered a cry of delight and no wonder any girl would have loved it the walls and woodwork were ivory white soft pink and light blue hangings fluttered at the windows a large bowl filled with pink roses and turquoise blue lark spars stood on the little golden dressing-table with its folding mirrors a little white ivory princess dresser with its full-length mirror stood across one corner and an ivory white bed across the other corner on the rocking chair and bed and dresser were painted pink and blue flowers and the covers of the table bed and dresser were embroidered with the same designs there was a wardrobe in the corner and in it mary frances found the loveliest dressing gown of pink crepe de chine embroidered with sprays of light blue forget-me-nots and white daisies with yellow centers and pink roses and a pair of light blue bedroom slippers and silk stockings and a boudoir cap and nightgown and a big steamer coat and cap all just the right size just like a grown-up young lady she thought there were two more doors one led to a pretty white bathroom and the other to a little dining-room lined with mirrors i can't get lonesome thought mary frances with so many knees about me and she laughed and just as she laughed food appeared on the table there were chicken soup and celery and olives and crackers oh dear how hungry i am she exclaimed i guess this is meant for me and she sat down on the one chair at the table and began to eat the soup i feel lots better she said finishing the last drop it's not good table manners to tip this plate she thought but i guess my reflections will excuse me and she bowed to the pictures of herself in the mirrors and laughed then suddenly the soup course disappeared from the table and in its place there were roast turkey and cranberry sauce and roasted sweet potatoes and apple sauce and the many other things which go to make an all-around feast how wonderful exclaimed mary frances helping herself to turkey but how stupid to eat by myself with only myself for company just then she looked out of the porthole window and saw the dolphin swimming ahead of the little ship 
I'll go invite the dolphin to dinner, she thought, and went on deck. Imagine her surprise to find that there was no land in sight. Neither was there any ship. The only other thing than the dolphin was the seagulls flying overhead. Hello! Hello! shouted Mary Frances, making a trumpet of her hands. Mr. Dolphin! Mr. Dolphin! One moment, please. The dolphin turned and looked at her. Yes, he asked, raising one eyebrow. Please, Mr. Dolphin, do you ever eat? I am lonesome eating all alone. I only eat fish, said the dolphin. They are in my element, you see. I do not find my food out of my element. Oh, as to that, replied Mary Frances, I will fill a bowl with your element, if you will only accept the invitation. Agreed, said the dolphin, swimming to the rope ladder hanging over the side of the ship. Mary Frances leaned down and caught hold of his fins when within reach and helped him up. When the dolphin reached the deck, she picked up a fire pail with a rope attached, threw it overside, and brought up a pail of water. Then she hastened to the dining room and brought a bowl. After that, she helped the dolphin to the dining table. The only chair was clamped in place to the floor, just as on any steamer, and she could not move it. So she changed her place to the side of the table. As the chair was a revolving one, like a desk chair, she turned and turned until it reached the right height for the dolphin. She placed the bowl of water, element, she called it, at the dolphin's place. Is there anything on the table, Mr. Dolphin? she asked, which you would like. Yes, sighed the dolphin. I would like some more salt in my element soup. Mary Frances gravely shook the salt shaker over the bowl for a full minute. The dolphin tasted the water. A little more, please, he said. So Mary Frances emptied almost all the rest of the salt out of the shaker into the bowl. The dolphin dipped in his head. That's excellent, he said, smacking his lips. Mercy, thought Mary Frances. I do hope he won't turn into a salt mackerel. Salt mackerel is my pet name, said the dolphin, smacking his lips again and wiping them with his fin. I hardly dare think, thought Mary Frances, yet I can't help thinking, can I? What queer table manners he has! I suppose his mother never taught him not to smack his lips when he eats, just to chew with the lips closed. I chew all I choose, exclaimed the dolphin. My mother never sat at a table, you see. Oh, said Mary Frances, did she stand? Three feet high in her stocking feet, solemnly declared the dolphin, which Mary Frances didn't consider an answer at all, but was too polite to say anything that might be annoying to a guest. I wonder what I can give him for dessert, she thought. If you please, said the dolphin, and Mary Frances noticed that he was very pale. If you please, I do not care for any. You see, I have deserted my post. That is enough dessert for me, and I shouldn't wonder if I'll be punished enough for it in a minute. Oh, oh, what is that? It's the pirate's cat. And with a scream, he leaped out of the window into the water. End of section two. Section three of the Mary Frances Storybook this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dahlman. The Mary Frances Storybook by Jane Eyre Fryer. The Pirate's Cat. Meow, meow, came the cat's voice from the door. Oh, kitty, kitty, cried Mary Frances, running toward it. Why, wherever did you come from? I thought I had looked all over the ship. Indeed, replied the cat. Even if you had, and you have not, you wouldn't have found me. The pirate's been watching a year to throw me on board the good fairy. Oh, exclaimed Mary Frances. The pirate. Why, I haven't seen any pirate. Of course you haven't, said the cat. He's too smart for that. 
he's been watching for a time when the dolphin had deserted his post oh dear thought mary frances it was all my fault but out loud she said well no great harm can come of it anyway won't you have some dinner yes thank you said the cat looking longingly at the table take this chair invited mary frances pointing to the dolphin's place the cat leaped up on the chair and carefully tucked a napkin into the collar on its neck mary frances filled a plate with turkey and potatoes and gravy and set it before the cat who politely waited for her to take her place and begin to eat do not wait for me kitty said his hostess i have finished this course thank you soon nothing was left on the plate just as mary frances was going to suggest that ice cream might make a nice dessert the cat began to tremble it trembled so that the ship shook all over why what is the matter asked mary frances are you chilly oh dear no replied the cat its teeth chattering oh dear no but i forgot the pirate will hang me he will he will why will he hang you asked mary frances quite bewildered and a little frightened speak softly said the cat come here and i'll whisper and behind his upraised paw he told the pirate ordered me to eat the dolphin and to bring his right fin to prove that i had done it and now i am too full of dinner to do it eat him indeed said mary frances angrily i'd like to see you oh would you cried the cat if you only hadn't given me so much dinner you might have had the pleasure that is if the dolphin had come aboard again you see i can't do it now i can't catch him in the water and the pirate said that he'd come for me in an hour and nine minutes it's close to that now glancing at the clock oh what shall i do why does the pirate want the dolphin killed hush exclaimed the cat speak softly come here i'll whisper the reason to you it's on account of the lost story he thinks you might find it and if the dolphin is destroyed he can run down the good fairy he can't do the work himself for he is bound in chains on his own ship but he has prisoners on board whom he orders about just as he did me he can't get within miles of the good fairy if the dolphin is guiding her he was so mad that he didn't notice when the dolphin first came aboard that the foam from his mouth was strong soap suds and washed the black decks of the pirate ship snow white but said mary frances you forget if the dolphin guides the ship the pirate can't get you at that the cat began to laugh joyously and it laughed so hard that mary frances laughed too and suddenly the meat course disappeared off the table and a huge block of ice cream appeared in its place and mary frances and the cat you know what they did end of chapter three section four of the mary frances storybook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jennifer dolman the mary frances storybook by jane eyre fryer the story of the lost story let's go on deck said mary frances when they had finished and perhaps you can tell me more about the lost story but first you must solemnly promise that you will not eat the dolphin i solemnly promise said the cat with upraised paw very well said mary frances leading the way to the deck chair on which she lay down while the cat curled himself up on a coil of rope near her head it happened in this way began the cat in a low tone of voice as he nervously looked around you know the enchanted island is storyland and the home of the story people 
the story king and queen have ruled there forever well one day a wicked fellow who had always said there was no such things as fairies somehow got on to the enchanted island it has always been a mystery to me how he did it and stole a story and carried it away and hid it the trouble is that no fairy is allowed to find it the boy or girl who takes it back will be the first person allowed to enter the enchanted island since it was lost do you know where it is hidden asked mary frances i have a slight idea whispered the cat is it on board the pirate ship she asked it cannot be i have searched everywhere 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 drowsily replied the cat mary frances noticed that his eyes were closing just one more thing before you go to sleep puss just one more thing she said do you know how long it will take to reach the enchanted island and they sailed away a year and a day to the land where the palm tree grew murmured the cat and shake him as she might that was the only answer mary frances could get until at length she could get no answer at all after she was certain he was asleep she went to the bow of the boat and called softly to the dolphin he swam up close alongside are you all right he asked i am indeed replied mary frances but i want to tell you what the cat told me first i want to say that he will not hurt you because he is horribly afraid of the pirate and he knows that he is safe on the good fairy as long as you protect it that's right said the dolphin and now how about the cat's tail then mary frances told the dolphin the story the cat had told her why can't we search for it now she asked well replied the dolphin i am not exactly sure about the cat's tail myself and every year i take one person direct to the island that's my orders that's my orders none of them have ever found the lost story so i have taken them direct home that's been my orders that's been my orders better go on i say better not take anybody else's word i say i say all right said mary frances just as you say but a year's a pretty long time that depends replied the dolphin a year's queer if it's full of fear a year's a day if it's full of play and i've heard say a year will leap if you're sound asleep and away it swam and then mary frances noticed that the sky was getting dark and she realized that she was very sleepy she made her way to the white cabin and undressed and went to bed wearing the pretty clothing which he had found in the wardrobe if i waken suddenly and want to go on deck i'll have on my negligee she thought as she tied the dressing-gown in place and slipped on the boudoir cap end of section four section five of the mary frances storybook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by jennifer dahlman the mary frances storybook by jane eyre fryer land ahoy mary frances awoke with a start and rubbed her eyes surely i heard somebody call she said again came the call land ahoy land ahoy why that is what they called out on columbus's ship when they discovered america thought mary frances hurriedly dressing i wonder if we are discovering anything it was just getting light as she ran out on deck at first she did not see any living thing except the dolphin which was swimming ahead of the boat she gazed around on the water it was a deep blue color it looks like the tub of bluing water when nora rinses the clothes she thought i wonder if it will color anything she ran to the railing dipped up a pailful and dropped in her handkerchief just clear water she said and hung it up to dry land ahoy came the call once more mary frances looked up at the sails there was the cat 
he was sitting on the rope ladder and holding his forepaws like a telescope as soon as he saw mary frances he pointed ahead and shouted land ahoy then she saw a dim outline of coast the cat scrambled down the rigging and ran up to her story island see he said why exclaimed mary frances why how long have i been asleep i thought you said something about a year ha ha laughed the cat a year and a day i said and that it nearly is you have been asleep just three hundred and sixty-five days and some hours have i really exclaimed mary frances then hearing a sudden splash in the water oh what was that was it the pirate that that wasn't anything to be afraid of just some flying fish answered the cat do they really have wings asked mary frances they certainly do come let us look into the water and see if there are any near the boat said the cat oh 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 exclaimed mary frances what a beautiful fish i see it has a tail of gold and a head of blue turquoise blue isn't it beautiful see it there yes i do said the cat it is an angelfish an angelfish that's just the right name for it said mary frances yes i believe somebody who tasted one named it that said the cat surely nobody would eat such a beautiful creature mary frances said the cat smiled its beauty is more than skin deep he said well i wouldn't eat anything so lovely said mary frances that reminds me of a rhyme a fish taught me said the cat that sounds mighty fishy thought mary frances but she did not say anything shall i say it for you and without waiting to hear he went on o oh, mother if you lived down in the sea and a fish you had to be what kind of fish would be your wish my own would be an angel fish with nose of loveliest turquoise blue and tail wings of yellowest golden hue i am sure my most angelic wish is to be an angel fish don't you suppose when fishes die their dream is never toward the sky but if they're good their dearest wish is to be an angelfish that is a pretty angelic wish i'll say added the cat oh there are some flying fish pointing to a distance from the boat they're not anything like as pretty as the angelfish said mary frances oh see the whale spouting exclaimed the cat running to the other side of the boat and mary frances saw a long fountain of water shooting up in the air my said the cat if i could just catch that whale i could feed every hungry cat i ever heard of why how big is it asked mary frances it's twenty times as long as half again and double the quarter wide said the cat how large is that if you please asked mary frances if the length is multiplied by the thickness and then by breadth, it will give the correct volume said the cat at least that's according to tickle tickle asked mary frances what is tickle tickle is short for arithmetical replied the cat oh said mary frances we don't call it arithmetical we call it arithmetic that is nothing like so pretty a name said the cat and you get the same result but the size of the whale said mary frances what is it can't you do a simple little problem like that when i have given you the rule asked the cat mary frances did not like to say that she had to give it up let bygones be bygones said the cat and look up whales in the dictionary when you reach the island oh yes exclaimed mary frances oh i can see i th think i can see some houses oh look cat look they are pure white don't you know why asked the cat i suppose they are painted said mary frances painted me whiskers exclaimed the cat they are not painted they are made of coral what is coral asked mary frances come i will show you said the cat leading the way to the middle of the deck he lifted a wooden cover 
underneath was a deep box the bottom of the box was made of glass now you can see the bottom of the sea said the cat see 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 the bottom of the sea oh look at those white trees cried mary frances gazing down into the clear water through the glass the cat laughed they are not trees he said they are coral formations and he told her about the tiny coral insects which build coral growth by fastening their tiny shell bodies to each other do they know that they're making trees asked mary frances oh my no said the cat they just grow naturally like any other babies sometimes they make fan-like forms or sponge-shaped ones did they build the white houses over on the island asked mary frances of course not said the cat what a curious question they live only in the sea the houses are up in the air but they built the island not that big island exclaimed mary frances you have not counterdicted me before said the cat if you know all about it i beg your pardon said mary frances very humbly will you please tell me the rest they rest on the bottom of the ocean said the cat the houses are made of the coral which is dug out of the cellars he went on but come let us get ready we are getting near port and he began to wash his face and smooth back his whiskers mary frances took the hint and went into the cabin she tidied her hair and put on a fresh ribbon and when she went on deck she took her pocket mirror with her end of section five section six of the mary frances storybook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jennifer dolman the mary frances storybook by jane eyre fryer the old witch and the iron chain curtain are my whiskers straight is my fur smooth is my face clean please asked the cat without stopping as soon as he saw her you may see for yourself said mary frances holding the pocket mirror before him ah he said giving a sigh of relief i look absolutely scrubbed i guess i'll do dear me said mary frances i do wonder how it will seem isn't this a beautiful place but i wonder why it looks so misty around the island can't we ask the dolphin i guess we better not said the cat you see a pilot doesn't like to be questioned there's a boat coming this way exclaimed mary frances the cat began to shiver his fur stood up on end his tail lashed to and fro it's the old witch's boat he cried she's the pirate's wife i'm not afraid i'm not afraid i'm not afraid though and he kept on saying i'm not afraid so often that mary frances began to laugh st stop that laughing came the voice of the old witch st stop that laughing this instant unless you have the lost story and if we have it madam witch called out the cat what then by this time the boat was quite near they could see the old witch tremble she turned almost as white as snow her two front teeth chattered if you had it the curtain would part she suddenly exclaimed laughing i forgot for a moment don't try to fool me cat away with you away with you find it if you can find it if you can ha 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 and she waved an oar at the boat then mary frances saw that all around the island was stretched an iron chain curtain don't look at it sissy said the old witch it's so strong that st steel will not s saw it it will remain about st story island and will not open until the lost st story is found and until it is found not a boy or girl in the world will hear a new st story we will find it shouted mary frances we will find it and bring it back and open the curtain ha ha laughed the old witch holding her sides 
ha ha it is well hid it is well hid you will be old and gray before you find it i'll warrant and as for the cat he will be so old he will sh shake around in his skin i'll warrant ha ha be off be off and quickly turning her boat she rowed away end of section six section seven of the mary frances storybook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jennifer dalman the mary frances storybook by jane eyre fryer finding the lost story the cat looked at mary frances mary frances looked at the cat ha ha and ha ha said the cat we'll laugh at her some day we will said mary frances we will puss let us call the dolphin the dolphin swam up at that moment whither now it asked where shall we go cat sixty four degrees forty minutes west thirty two degrees forty minutes north said the cat and the dolphin swam ahead turned the boat and soon the island was out of sight come i am hungry said mary frances let us go into the dining-room the dolphin has plenty of element soup she thought there was a table spread with a fine feast and both she and the cat enjoyed it just as they were finishing dessert they heard a pounding noise they rushed out on deck the noise was made by the dolphin hitting the side of the boat with its tail it whispered two words pirate ship and swam ahead again the cat made a telescope with his paws and looked out over the water sure enough he cried in fear oh my oh my and i haven't eaten the dolphin for shame exclaimed mary frances for shame you have forgotten that he can't come very near while the dolphin is at his post oh yes that is so excuse me please but what does the pirate mean by coming i wonder do you suppose he thinks we may be near finding the story asked mary frances that's it exclaimed the cat i'll wager my whiskers that's his idea so if we espy it he'll get it first do you think we'll find it asked mary frances my fur feels as though we would said the cat please tell me is it sending out sparks it was growing quite late in the afternoon and quite dusky mary frances to her astonishment saw great showers of electric sparks coming from the cat's body you look like a sparkler on the fourth of july cat she said oh isn't that fine said the cat you see it's this way the nearer we get to the story the more sparklier my fur gets so we must be quite near said mary frances for i don't see how you could get much more sparklier i forgot to tell you said the cat that after we find the story the dolphin's power to keep the pirate away is gone we'll have to race like a rocket to beat his boat oh my what is the matter exclaimed mary frances as the cat suddenly jumped high in the air sending out a shower of sparks that fell at her feet on the deck over the side of the boat he fell and all was dark as a pocket oh kitty kitty cried the frightened girl running to look into the water but she saw nothing of the cat neither could she see the dolphin she could see the dim light of the pirate's ship and it seemed quite near whatever shall i do thought mary frances i really believe i'm going to cry just at that minute she heard a scratching on the side of the good fairy who's there she whispered no answer came just another scratching who's there she asked again meow came a faint voice mary frances could see better now for her eyes were getting accustomed to the darkness is it you puss she asked peering down into the water when she saw it was the cat she quickly let down the rope ladder and the cat climbed aboard and fell in a wet heap at her feet she lifted him carefully and carried him to the steamer chair she did not notice that something dropped from his mouth as she lifted him she dried his wet fur and went to the dining-room to get him a drink of water there she saw a bowl of beef tea which she took to him 
she fed him a little at a time with a medicine dropper which he had found in the bathroom at length he opened his eyes where is it he asked where is what asked mary frances the lost story whispered the cat i carried it in my mouth that is why i couldn't answer you when you asked who was there i didn't see it said mary frances oh dear oh dear exclaimed the cat it must be on deck let us look for it you are not able yet said mary frances lie still i will look was it a roll or a book it was a glass bottle said the cat and it may have rolled back into the sea if that is what you mean by was it a roll mary frances went down on her hands and knees she crept all over the deck feeling for it in the darkness after a while the cat helped they worked all night but they could find nothing in the morning as it grew light they both saw a dark green bottle caught in the top of the rope ladder which was fastened to the side of the boat so lightly was the bottle held that it might easily have fallen back into the water and been lost again mary frances lifted it carefully it was labeled the lost story the bottle was sealed with a cork and inside was a roll of paper oh isn't it too good to be true exclaimed mary frances where shall we hide it let's label it ketchup and put it on the side table in the dining room said the cat put the new label right over the old one he added that's a splendid idea cried mary frances i'll do it right away end of section seven section eight of the mary frances storybook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mary Frances Storybook by Jane Eyre Fryer Section 8. The Pirate Chases the Good Fairy When Mary Frances came on deck again, the good fairy was ploughing the water so fast that a deep furrow of foam followed her. The dolphin was swimming so fast that it made deep waves with the motion of its tail although going so rapidly they could see that the pirate's black ship was keeping the distance the same as at first between them i believe he is gaining at length said the cat who was using his paws for a telescope mary frances looked a little pale but smiled i think we will make more time in a minute she said let's drop something overboard and he may stop to pick it up so they filled a suitcase with paper and dropped it over the side they were delighted when they saw the pirate ship stop to pick it up they could hear the loud ravings of the pirate when he found nothing inside the rest of the trip was very exciting for the pirate ship at one time was so close that they heard the pirate say to the cook blast ye blast ye why don't ye jump overboard ye can make it in two jumps jump yourself replied the cook faster and faster swam the dolphin faster and faster sailed the good fairy try as he would the pirate could not overtake them they saw him plainly half a knot behind jumping up and down on his deck shaking his angry fists as they reached the island he turned and gave up the chase in defeat when they came to the wharf there stood the old witch drinking ink out of a bottle ha ha she honked so you think you've got the lost story do you well you haven't so there then she began to wave her arms about her head laughing wildly as mary frances stepped off the boat the old witch tried to snatch the story bottle out of her hand oh you can't scare me said mary frances step aside please and as she pushed past the wild old witch the great iron chain curtain fell with a crash and before her was fairyland or storyland which as you know are one and the same end of section eight section nine of the mary frances story book this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dahlman. The Mary Frances Storybook by Jane Eyre Fryer. The Terrible Punishment of the Pirate and the Old Witch. Mary Frances heard music and singing. She heard the words, Who is the bravest in this land? She who holds in her right hand the long lost precious story. She is the bravest in this land. Then Mary Frances remembered and stepped forward with the story. She was met by a beautiful young lady who introduced herself as the story lady in a small company of story people who led her to the castle of the king and queen of Story Island. They took her into the court where the rulers sat in state. Welcome, said the story king, rising. Welcome, said the story queen, rising. Then the king made a speech. You have done us a great service, young friend, he said, and we hope to do something for you to show how much we appreciate it. Sir, said Mary Frances, handing him the bottle, if it had not been for the dolphin and the cat, I never could have found the story. The dolphin has been rewarded, said the story king. He has had his head cut off. Oh, cried Mary Frances, the poor dear dolphin. And has been turned again into a prince, added the story queen. He was the prince who kissed the sleeping beauty, and was under the spell of the old witch outside the chain curtain. And the cat has been rewarded, said the king. He has charge of all the cats and kittens and all the stories ever told, or ever to be told. This made Mary Frances happy, for she knew the cat would love that charge. Now, said the Story King, if you are not too tired, we will get over the business of trying the pirate and the witch. I am not tired, thank you, said Mary Frances, for I slept three hundred and sixty-five days and nights on my way here. Good, said the King, please have this seat, and he led her to a deep blue velvet chair. The King then touched a button under the table, and a door opened. In came a large man with a large beard. Mary Frances knew him at once. He was Bluebeard. He was trembling terribly. Fetch in the pirate, Bluebeard, ordered the king. Bluebeard bowed and left the room. Soon there came the clanging of chains, and Bluebeard led the pirate into the room, all wound up in a great section of the iron chain curtain. He was dreadfully pale and very angry. His mouth was frothing, and his breath was coming out of his nostrils like smoke. He glowered at Mary Frances as though he would like to bite her, but she was not afraid. Behave, said the king. You cannot frighten a person who has been so brave as to part the iron chain curtain. If she had been afraid of the old witch, the curtain would have not parted, and all of the children in the world would have been still waiting for new stories. He turned to the queen. Have you a fitting punishment, my dear? he asked. I have, said the queen, very solemnly it is this the pirate shall never again hear a story or read a story on hearing his fate the pirate screamed anything rather than that please have mercy and he fell down in a dead faint blue beard dragged him out immediately after the king ordered the old witch in tell the story of the lost story ordered the king oh sir stammered the old witch Oh, sir, the pirate st stole it and took it on his sh ship, and I st stole it from him and put it in a bottle, and I was going to bring it back, but I lost it overboard in a st storm. I didn't want the pirate to know I took it, for he would have beaten me to death. Why did you try to take it from this young lady? asked the queen. The old witch hung her head. Because I wanted to keep it for myself she said well what shall her punishment be my dear said the king she shall be punished by never hearing the end of a story declared the queen only to the middle of a story shall she hear never to the end then the old witch gave a loud shriek and ran out of the room as fast as she could the king sent a giant after her and had him lock both the pirate and the old witch up in big iron baskets and carry them off to the end of snowware and now my dear said the king what is to be your dear little friend's reward two rewards shall be hers replied the queen one is that she shall know that all the children of the world can have new stories every day 
and the other is that she can stay with us for a visit and hear all the stories she wishes to hear very good said the king now let us hear the lost story and all of the story people sat down to form a double circle with that the story lady dressed like a butterfly came dancing in the king opened the green bottle took out the roll of paper and handed it to her she took her place at the end just where the circle closed and began to read aloud the lost story which is entitled the bubble story end of section nine section ten of the mary frances storybook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by eve social media at y s eve chan the mary frances storybook by jane eyre fryer the bubble story lilla walked through the garden saying i would like to be a princess for she had been reading a story about a princess who had only to say come and anything she wished for came at once it was a hot summer day and she sat down on a mossy bank under an elm tree thinking what she should wish for if she had the power of the princess all at once the garden seemed strange to her and she heard a voice saying if you take a rose from me you will then a princess be she looked up and saw an aster growing in a green flower-pot which she had never seen before and on one of the flowers was perched a tiny fairy and you can have everything that you can wish for except one thing if you wish for that you will lose the rose and what is that asked lilla taking the rose which the fairy offered her you must never ask for soap bubbles oh soap bubbles of course i shall not wish for them said lilla whenever you want anything said the fairy just say rose rose bring to me everything i wish to see you will be a princess as long as you keep the rose but you must never ask for soap bubbles good-bye now i must go back to my home so the fairy went to fairyland and lilla went home but no one knew her because she was now a princess with long hair and a golden crown i will go up to the castle on the hill thought lilla princesses go there to stay at the castle they were expecting a princess so they thought lilla must be the one who was coming and they gave her a grand room all hung with velvet curtains to sleep in on the table was a silver box which lilla thought was right to keep her rose in now i shall try what i can do with my rose thought lilla so she thought of a box of toys and said rose rose bring to me everything i wish to see scarcely had she spoken when a maid came to say that a box had come for her when the box was opened lilla saw so many pretty things that she thought she would like a christmas tree to hang them on and again she said rose rose bring to me everything i wish to see and in a few minutes a christmas tree arrived hung all over with golden and silver drops and coloured lights and bonbons and still more bonbons and gifts of all kinds the people at the castle had never seen such a beautiful christmas tree and they were delighted with the gifts which lilla divided among them day after day lilla asked her rose for something new and every day more and more beautiful things came till not only her own room but the whole castle was full of them she gave them away to every one for soon she grew tired of them every day she was trying to think of something she did not have but at last there seemed nothing left to wish for that was when she began to long for soap bubbles which were the only things she must not have but how beautiful thousands of soap bubbles would look floating around in the sunshine with rainbow colours upon them she thought she could think of nothing else and grew quite sad because she could not ask for soap bubbles so one day she went into the garden taking her rose with her shall i ask or shall i not she kept thinking but she could not make up her mind so she counted on the buttons of her dress yes no yes no yes no my mother told me to say yes no oh dear sighed lilla i wanted it to come yes i'm going to ask for them so she said the magic rhyme rose rose bring to me everything i wish to see but no soap bubbles came she looked all around the garden even up in the branches of the trees but no bubbles were to be seen then she grew impatient she took the rose and said rose rose bring to me everything i wish to see then suddenly the air was filled with soap bubbles little ones big ones floated all over the garden oh aren't they lovely cried lilla holding out her arms to catch some 
and then a bubble larger than the others opened and closed around the golden rose and lifted it out of her hand floated quickly away with it higher 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 until lilla could no longer see it she watched and watched until only two soap bubbles were to be seen then she sank on her knees and stretched out her hands after them but it was too late her rose was gone the bubbles were gone and she was no longer a princess her hair was as short as it had ever had been and her crown had disappeared it was of no use to return to the castle now as the people would not know her where would she go what could she do she was so worried that she cried aloud and you can imagine how glad she was to hear her own mother's voice saying lilla dear you must have fallen asleep come wake up tell mother about your dream why mother it was just like a story said lilla sitting up and rubbing her eyes then she told her mother all about it a very pretty story said her mother and one that shows you that people who can have almost everything they wish for are not really happier than others there is always something just out of their reach and that makes them discontented with what they have yes even soap bubbles said lilla laughing that's a good story too good to be lost said the story king when the story lady finished yes but we have better and you shall hear some of them to-morrow said the story queen to mary frances smiling graciously then to the people she announced there will be a reception in the court of honour this evening to our visitor mary frances the finder of the lost story as it is now dark let every one retire and prepare then all the people applauded formed in a line and marched out each bowing to the king queen and mary frances who stood rather timidly in her place with the story lady beside her after the others were gone the story lady turned to her and said the queen has planned for you to be in my charge during your visit and all you wish to see or hear is at your command how kind and how perfectly lovely exclaimed mary frances clapping her hands i couldn't possibly wish for anything i would rather have than to be with you this pleased the story lady greatly and she led the way to their apartments i wish i had the time and space to tell you more about the wonderful and delightful reception how mary frances stood in a line with the king and queen and was introduced to all the people of the island as a distinguished visitor whose deed would never be forgotten as long as stories were told but if i were to relate all they said and did this book could not hold one quarter of the stories which the story lady had planned for mary frances to hear the revels continued far into the night and when at last they ended mary frances retired to her apartment excited and happy as the story lady kissed her good night she said to-morrow will be the first day end of section ten recording by eve social media at ys eve chan section eleven of the mary frances storybook this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Mary Frances Storybook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Stories Told the First Day Mischievous Anna and Peter now you must know that the story people met at a certain hour every day to hear and to tell stories new and old for as you may well believe it is no small task to provide stories enough to feed the story-hungry children of the world accordingly when all were assembled the story king in his place and mary frances in the seat of honor beside the story queen the story lady began to tell the story of mischievous anna and peter anna and peter were always in mischief one day they climbed to the top of a high wall it was a fairy wall and it grew higher and higher until at last it went so high that they got frightened for they did not know how they should get down again so they held tight by each other and the wall and they began to cry but no one heard them for they were far away from home besides they were as high up in the air as the top of a mountain oh 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 sobbed anna 
oh 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 sobbed peter and their eyes were red and their faces quite wet and dirty i shall fall said peter i can't hold on much longer said anna and then they both sobbed oh 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 again then they heard a voice saying oh 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 after them only it was not any one crying for the oh 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 had a very sweet sound they could not look around for they dared not move their heads and they dared not look down for fear of getting dizzy but the voice seemed to be coming nearer and so it was for a fairy gate with a tree beside it and a little bit of ground to stand upon was shooting up into the air just as the wall had done and when it was as high as the wall it stopped and peter and anna saw that a boy was leaning against the gate he was playing on a whistle pipe and that made the sound they had heard i will play you a tune said the boy and he played so softly and sweetly that peter and anna left off crying how did you come up asked anna on the gate said the boy how are you going down asked peter on the gate to be sure said the boy i have only to say gate gate let me go far down to the earth below and as he said the words down he went let us also try said anna wall wall let us go far down to the earth below then down went the wall to the ground, and Peter and Anna slid off and stood staring at the boy, who was still playing on his pipe. "'What do you want most?' asked the boy. "'My pipe will bring anything I ask for.' "'A silk frock with a flounce and sash and a bonnet with blue ribbons,' said Anna, who was fond of fine clothes." a new suit and a pair of leather reins to play at horses with said peter the boy played a lively tune and before anna could say ready she found herself dressed in a fine new frock while peter had reins in his hands and a new suit of clothes with a great frill and a round hat then the boy said good-bye and peter and anna went towards home I will go this way said peter i will go that said anna so they parted anna as she walked along heard little feet behind her and when she reached the steps leading to her home she looked around and what was her surprise when she saw a large mouse dressed like a lady with a parasol in its hand i am the countess mouse coming to your house with you i'll stay every day said the mouse now anna was afraid of mice and she said but i do not want you besides we have a large cat that will eat you up no it will not i am a fairy mouse and can eat up the cat if i please anna was much frightened this was truly a dreadful mouse go away oh go away she said no answered the mouse as long as you wear my clothes i shall stay with you and take care of them they are not yours said anna a boy with a whistle pipe gave them to me but he piped to me for them said the mouse i have wardrobes full in my castle you are quite welcome to them but i must see that you do not spoil them i shall sit by you at dinner and play with you and walk out with you and sleep on your pillow at night oh dear oh dear said anna i wish i had never asked for a silk frock and bonnet shall i take them back oh yes oh yes please countess mouse take them all back to your house well as you have made a rhyme i will do so said the mouse 
and she slapped Anna's arm sharply with her parasol. Then Anna's new clothes fell off, and she found herself in her old cotton dress again. And the mouse grew larger and larger, and ran away to her castle with the silk frock and the grand bonnet. Now while this was happening to Anna, a queer-looking man in a peaked hat and long overcoat said to Peter, Shall I be your horse? Yes, said Peter, and the man took the reins, and they went along merrily enough. When they were close by his home, Peter said, I am going in here. But the man said, No, no, you are going with me. These are my reins. You cannot get free. They cannot be yours, said Peter. A boy with a whistle pipe gave them to me. Ah, but he got them from me. I am a saddler, and have hundreds of them, and I want some little boys to help me to make more. I don't want to go, said Peter. But he could not lose the reins, and the man pulled him along faster and faster. Oh, oh, I should be glad if these reins I hadn't had, said Peter. As you have made a rhyme, said the man, I'll take them back, and you may go home. Then the man hit Peter sharply with one end of the reins, and his new suit fell off, and he found himself in his old pinafore. Then Peter went home and told Anna what had happened to him, and Anna told Peter all about the mouse, and they both thought they had had a lucky escape. Just then the boy with the pipe came down the street, and the pipe played these words. Keep out of mischief, you never know, what may come to cause you woe. What you may think is very good fun, may give you trouble before you're done. Then the boy turned round the corner of the street, and Anna and Peter never saw him again. My! But the mouse must have looked cunning, Mary Frances said. Thank you for telling me that story. I, I wish. Would you like to hear another about Isabella and her cruel stepsisters? Asked the story lady. I should love to hear it, replied Mary Frances. The story people smiled and nodded, and the story lady proceeded. End of section 11. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 12 of the Mary Frances Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ren Sampang. The Mary Frances Storybook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Section 12. Diamonds and Toads. Once upon a time there was a dear little girl named Isabella. She lived with her father and her stepmother and her two stepsisters. Isabella was a pretty child and had sweet manners. Her stepsisters were not pretty, and they and their mother were jealous of Isabella. They seldom spoke kindly to her. They made her do the hard work of the home and treated her in a harsh manner very much as Cinderella's stepmother and stepsisters treated Cinderella. One of her hard duties was to fetch the water for the household from the well just outside the village. It was quite a long walk to the well, and after Isabella had worked all the morning, cooking and washing the dishes and washing and ironing or sweeping, she felt sometimes that she was too tired to go so far and carry home such a heavy load. One day after washing and ironing, she said, I wish one of you girls would go with me to the well today and help me bring back the water. I am so tired. Indeed, they shall not, exclaimed her stepmother angrily. What do you think? That my daughter shall wait on you? I do not care to get tanned in the sun, yawned one. I do not wish my hands to look as though I work, said the other haughtily. So Isabella set out alone. She sat down to rest several times on her way. But after a while she reached the well. It was an old-fashioned affair, and had a moss-covered bucket on a long chain which wound on a roller. It was not hard work to drop the bucket down the well, 
but it was hard work to turn the handle of the roller until the dripping bucket reached the top. It was still harder work to empty the bucket into the pail she carried. This day, when Isabella came to the well, there was an old woman sitting on the well curb. She was a wretched-looking old woman. She wore an old shawl about her head and shoulders. When she saw Isabella, she said, "'Good morrow, little maid.' "'Good morning,' said the little girl. "'How do you do?' "'I should do very well, thank you,' said the old woman, "'if I had a drink of water.' "'That you shall soon have,' said Isabella, forgetting her own tiredness because she felt sorry for her. Isabella soon had the well bucket up, filled her pail, and held it so that the thirsty woman could drink out of the side. She drank long and eagerly. "'Thank you,' she said at length. "'Dear child, you will never be sorry for your kindness.' And she rose and walked away. Isabella threw away the rest of the water, and after refilling her pail, set out for home. When she reached the house, her stepmother said, "'You are late! Where have you been?' Isabella opened her mouth to answer. "'And what do you think happened?' Out fell diamonds and roses." Quickly the stepmother called her daughters, and they began to sweep them up. "'Where have you been?' cried the stepsisters. "'What has happened to you?' Isabella tried to think what could have brought such a thing about, for she was as much surprised as any of them. But she could not think of anything unusual except the meeting with the old woman. "'Speak!' demanded her stepmother. "'Are you trying to hide something from us?' Isabella said that she had met a strange old lady at the well but that she could not remember anything else that had not happened every time she had gone for water. Every once in a while, as she was speaking, diamonds and roses fell from her mouth. "'You need not go for the water next time,' said her stepmother. "'I shall send my own girls.' The next day, the two stepsisters went to fetch the water. When they came to the well, there sat the old ragged woman on the curb. "'Good morrow, young maidens,' said the old woman. The stepsisters just stared at her. "'My, it is a warm day,' said the old woman, "'and I am very thirsty. "'Will you give me a drink of water?' "'Indeed we will not,' said the older one haughtily. "'The very idea!' exclaimed the younger one, "'looking at the old woman's ragged clothes. "'I should think not.' "'Then they drew the water, "'all the time complaining and groaning about the hard work. "'When they started to go home, the old woman spoke. "'You are not kind.' she said. You will be sorry. But they only laughed and hurried away. Their mother met them at the door. Well, my dears, she said, how fared you? Did you meet any good fortune? All we saw was an old woman at the well. Such a ragged, wretched old thing she was, too, answered one girl, and she wanted us to give her a drink of water. The idea, the other girl said at the same time. With the last words, out of their mouth fell several snakes and toads, which went scudding across the floor. Their mother screamed and, gathering her skirts about her, jumped on a chair. "'Oh, where have you been?' she cried. "'What has happened to you?' And when the girls told her that they did not know, more snakes and toads fell from their mouths. "'This is an outrage. Isabella has formed some terrible plot against you. She is to blame. Go bring her here and I shall punish her.' I shall whip her until she tells us the charm she has found. The girls ran out and soon came back dragging Isabella between them. Just as they reached their mother, a bright light appeared in the room, and suddenly a beautiful fairy stood before them. Do not touch Isabella, she said to the stepmother. She is not in the least to blame for your children's misfortune. Their cruel fate is their own fault. When I met Isabella at the well and asked her for a drink of water, she gave it to me gladly and willingly, but when I met your daughters and asked them for a drink, they treated me proudly and unkindly. You! exclaimed the stepmother, looking upon the radiant creature with her shining fairy robes about her. Met you and would not give you a drink of water! The fairy smiled. Ah, yes, it was I, but I did not look then as I do now. I was the ragged old woman at the well. If they had known it was you, said the stepmother. If they had known it was I, the fairy said, how could I have judged whether they were kind of heart and polite to old people and helpful to people in need? When I met Isabella, the fairy went on, I looked just as when I met your daughters, and she was very polite and kind to me. 
and gave me a drink, holding the pail while I drank, even though she was very tired. Because only polite and kind words came from her mouth, I gave her a good fairy gift, and because only impolite and unkind words came from the mouths of your daughters, I gave them another kind of gift. Oh, please take back the one you gave them, pleaded the mother. Do you mean Isabella's gift, too? asked the fairy. Oh, no, the mother said. Let her have her gift, but please, please take away the awful gift of my daughters. Let me see, said the fairy. What Isabella says about that? Shall I take back the gift of your stepsisters, my dear? Oh, please, please do, cried Isabella. I'm so sorry that they're unhappy. Very well, then, said the fairy. For Isabella's sake, I shall take their gifts back, but only on one condition, that they promise to be kind and polite from now on. Oh, we promise, we promise, cried both stepsisters at once. Unless you keep your promise, said the fairy, the snakes and toads will come from your mouths again. And the fairy disappeared as suddenly as she had come. But the snakes and toads did not come again for the stepsisters and their mother were very kind to everyone ever after, and Isabella lived a happy life from that day. They just had to keep their promise, didn't they? commented Mary Frances. I am glad they did, for I do not like people to break promises. Neither do I, agreed the story lady, and that reminds me of one of our favorite stories, Coralie and the Magic Necklace. Oh, said Mary Frances, but I like a story with magic in it. Very well, said the story lady. I will tell you the story. End of section 12. Recording by Ren Sampang. Section 13 of the Mary Frances Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emma Charlotte. The Mary Frances Storybook by Jane Fairfriar. The Magic Necklace Once there was a girl whose name was Coralie. She was a very pretty girl, and very clever. She was so bright in her lessons at school that all she needed to do was to read them over once, and she knew them. She lived in a pretty home and was a great pet. Her parents loved her dearly, and although they were not well off, they gave Coralie everything she wished for that they could afford. So, you see, she had all the comforts of life, if not the luxuries. You would think she would have been a very happy child, wouldn't you? Well, she would have been, if she had not had one dreadful fault. Sometimes she told only half the truth. Sometimes she told only quarter the truth. Sometimes she stretched the truth so far that she broke it. Her parents did everything they could to cure her of her dreadful fault, but everything failed. Even being in her room for a whole day with only bread and butter and milk did not help her. At last they became almost desperate. One evening, after Coralie had gone to bed, her father said, there is only one thing left, I suppose. We must take Coralie to the magician Merlin. Yes, replied her mother with a sigh. It is the only thing I can think of. You need not go, dear husband, for it will mean the loss of several days' work. I will take her myself. We can start tomorrow morning. So, in the morning, her mother and Coralie set out on their journey. Now, the enchanter Merlin knew untruthful people even a long way off. He could tell them by their odour. So, as Coralie and her mother drew near his palace, which was built of frosted glass, 
he threw some incense on the fire to keep himself from becoming ill at length coralie's mother rang the doorbell and merlin himself came to the door good afternoon he said good afternoon replied coralie's mother we have come a long distance to see you sir because merlin raised his hand i know all about the reason he said you have come to see me because you cannot make your daughter tell the truth she is one of the most untruthful children that ever lived i know because her lies often make me ill when i smelled her coming i had to burn incense and he frowned terribly you can imagine how this frightened coralie she hid behind her mother her mother seemed frightened too oh sir she begged please deal as gently with her as you can we love her so dearly we are so grieved that we cannot cure her our own selves do not fear answered the magician i am not going to hurt her all that i wish to do is to make her a present so he invited them into the palace and led the way to his workroom all the woodwork in the room was light green the windows were studded with red and blue and green jewels and they threw rainbow colours on the floor merlin went to a golden table and opening a drawer took out a beautiful amethyst necklace with a diamond clasp he threw the necklace around coralie's neck that is all he said to her mother you may go i am going to lend my magic necklace of truth to coralie i shall come for it in one year then he turned to Coralie and said, Do not take it off. If you do, great harm may come to you. Goodbye. And he clapped his hands twice. Two slaves appeared, and after bowing before Merlin, showed Coralie and her mother to the door. Coralie, of course, was delighted with the necklace. All her life long she had wished for jewellery, but her parents could not afford to get her anything but the pretty seal ring which she wore. As to getting such a necklace as Merlin had given her, it would have taken everything they owned in the world to so much as buy the diamond clasp. When she went back to school, the girls all gathered about her and began to admire the necklace. Isn't it beautiful, they exclaimed. What a lucky girl. Your people must have fallen heirs to a fortune. Isn't it pretty, said Coralie, lifting the sparkling string for them to see better. Yes, my father and mother gave it to me. You see, I have been ill and they were so glad when I got well that they gave me this for a present. Oh, 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 cried the girls, and no wonder they did, for all the sparkle left the necklace, and it looked dull and old and scratched. What is the matter? asked Coralie. Don't you think my parents could give it to me? They bought it and paid an immense sum for it. At that falsehood, the necklace turned from the light purple amethyst colour to a dull grey agate, and the diamond clasp to a mud-colour shade. Then Coralie saw what had happened, and she was frightened. No, she said, they did not give it to me. We went to the magician Merlin, and he lent it to me. At these truthful words, the necklace became as beautiful as ever, but the children began to laugh. 
"'What are you laughing at?' asked Coralie. "'You needn't make fun. "'Merlin was very glad to see us. "'When he saw us in the distance, "'he sent his carriage to meet us. "'It was drawn by two fawn-coloured horses, "'and the coachman wore livery. "'There was a great feast spread for us, "'and each of us had a servant in back of our chairs. "'We had golden plates to eat from, and... Suddenly Coralie stopped speaking, for the children were laughing at her harder than ever. She looked down at her necklace. No wonder they laughed. It was dull again in colour, and had grown so long it rested upon the ground. Ho, ho, Coralie, cried one. Come now, you are stretching the truth. Set us right. Well confessed Coralie. Merlin didn't send anyone to meet us. We walked, and we were in his palace only a little while. At these words the necklace shrank to its right size, and resumed its own beautiful colour. But now, Coralie, cried the children, but now tell us truly where you got the necklace. Did the magician give it to you? Yes, said Coralie. He just handed it to me without saying a word. I think he... She did not finish the sentence, for the necklace had suddenly grown so tight that it was choking her, and she was gasping for breath. Come, come, Coralie, cried one of the girls. You are keeping back part of the truth. Tell the truth. What happened? He said I was one of the most untruthful persons in the world admitted Coralie, and the necklace became itself again. And so things kept on. Every time Coralie tried to say one untruthful thing, the necklace behaved in some queer, frightful way. Even the children became sorry for her, for she began to look worried all the time. If I were you, I'd take the necklace back, one of the girls told her. It gives you no happiness at all. Indeed it doesn't, said Coralie. I wish I... Why don't you take it back? The girl asked. Now Coralie did not wish to tell her, and kept still, for she was wondering what she could possibly say. But the necklace began to act wildly. The stones began to dance up and down so hard that they hurt her. Merlin told me I must not take it off, she said. If I should do so, great harm would come to me. He is coming for it when I've worn it for a year. And the necklace shone just a little more brightly than before, and the diamond clasp sparkled so that it would have dazzled your eyes to look at it. And after that, Coralie began to lose the worried look, for the telling of the truth was beginning to be a habit with her. The necklace very seldom had to remind her, for every day it grew easier for her to tell the truth. And when Merlin came for his necklace, he brought her a far more beautiful gift than the necklace, but it was one that she could not wear showily. It was a necklace of pearls, pearls of great price which she wore just over her heart. You see, Merlin needed his magic necklace for another child who did not tell the truth. Nobody knows where the magic necklace is today. But if I were a child in the habit of telling falsehoods, I should not feel quite sure that it would not be found again. Will it? asked Mary Frances as the story lady finished the story. It may be, said the story king. I have an idea where it is. Why? Do you know any children who do not speak the truth? I, I am sorry to say that I do, Mary Frances said. I do not know many, though. I know two who do not always tell the truth, and I know one child who isn't kind to her pet cat. I wish I knew a story to tell her when I go home. All right. Perhaps you would like to hear the story of Linda. 
Please tell it to me, she asked. So the story lady told the story of the cat and the carrots. End of section 13 Section 14 of the Mary Frances Storybook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emma Charlotte The Mary Frances Storybook by Jane Fairfriar Section 14 The Cat and the Carrot Linda was a little girl who rarely thought of anyone but herself. She would take the warmest place by the fire and the largest piece of cake on the dish, or the finest apple or pear, and she would take away the toys from the other children, and did not care for anything as long as she was amused herself. Her mother was very sorry to see that Linda was selfish, and used to talk very seriously to her about it, and to tell her that no one would love her if she did not mend her ways. But Linda did not care, and she did not believe what her mother said. You will always love me, mother, she said. Perhaps so, said her mother, but then you are my own little girl, and it is my duty to take care of you. Besides, I shall be very sorry for you, because you will be very unhappy. But no one else will care for you. Everyone will dislike you because you are selfish. Everyone in the world. Linda did not say anything, but the words, everyone in the world, came into her head many times during the day and at night they came into her dreams, and she fancied she saw the words written in letters of fire, from which the flames shot up in all directions, and she was saying half aloud, The bed will be on fire, when a voice said, But you are not in bed, you are in the farmyard. Then she looked round, and she saw that she was near the barn, and that there was a ladder not far off, and a great barrel close by. Also there was a heap of carrots, which Linda began to toss about, and to snap in two, and to pull the leaves off. And at last she was throwing them all into the duck pond, when a voice suddenly said, Stop! Linda looked round, but no one was to be seen. Stop, said the voice again. Then Linda looked down, and seated upon a stone she saw a carrot whose green top knot of leaves she had broken off. Two little legs and two little arms had sprouted out, and it had eyes and a mouth, but no nose. Have you no feelings? said the carrot. Is it not enough to be taken from my home in the earth? without being knocked about and flung into a duck pond. How would you like it? I'm not a carrot, said Linda. You don't care for anyone but yourself, replied the carrot, growing redder and redder. No one likes you, not even the carrots, and you will find that some day people will pay you back for being so selfish. I am going to begin at once. Come, carrots, carrots, he shouted. In and out, whirl about, pinch and beat her, let her know. Selfishness will bring her woe. Come at once and greet her. Then suddenly all the carrots that were lying about sprang up, and those that were in the duck pond sprang out of it. They were joined by those in the gardens near, and they came trooping along like an army. They could walk as well in the air as on the ground, and they whirled around Linda and pulled her hair and pinched her arms, till she cried aloud for mercy. Ho, 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 only see what it is our foe to be, shouted the carrots, as they twirled up and down and round and round. The air was full of carrots, 
and the ground was covered by them, and Linda made up her mind that if she ever got clear of them, she would never meddle with a carrot again as long as she lived. She kept off their blows as long as she could, but at last she was too tired to do so any longer, and she sank down to the ground crying, Oh, please, please leave off, please leave off. We now have done, but we've had some fun, said the carrot who had first spoken to her. Carrots depart, said he, waving his hand. The last carrot had said, Goodbye, but Linda had not spoken. She waited till she thought he had gone, and then she looked up. The carrot certainly was not there, but a large cat was sitting beside her. Topsy, poor Topsy, said Linda. But Topsy put up her back, and her eyes looked very fierce. Poor Topsy indeed, said the cat angrily. Don't think to coax me. You never think of me in the house. You pull my whiskers and my tail, and you never give me a bit of meat or anything nice that you are eating. And this morning, though I sat on the chair beside you, longing for a little new milk, you drank it all up. You did not leave me a drop. You are the most selfish little girl I know, and I don't like you, so I am going to scratch you. Oh dear, oh dear, said Linda, please don't. The carrots have punished me till I am quite sore. Cats, cats, one and all, tabby tortoise shell, come when I call. Grey and yellow, black and white, cats and kittens come hither to-night, called the cat loudly. Ah, all the cats and kittens in the world must have come. So many and they all thronged round her, and sat upon her shoulders, and clung round her arms. All the cats in the world hate you, said Topsy. We do, we do, mewed the cat. She never cares what becomes of poor cats and kittens. Then the cats tumbled over each other, and tumbled over Linda and crowded round her and upon her, until she was sitting under a heap of cats, with only her face peeping out, and Topsy was crouching in front, looking fiercely at her. Now that you cannot stir, said Topsy, I am going to scratch you. Oh, 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 shrieked Linda, and she gave such a start that all the cats fell down upon the ground, and at that moment she opened her eyes, and found herself in her bed, with her mother standing beside her. "'What is the matter?' asked her mother, for she had heard Linda scream. "'Oh, oh, oh,' sobbed Linda, "'I have had such a horrid dream.' "'Well, it was only a dream.' You are awake now, and I am with you. Everyone in the world hates me, even the cats and the carrots, sobbed Linda. And bit by bit she told her mother all the dream. Such a horrid dream, and I was so frightened, said Linda. I can't think why it came. I will tell you, said her mother. It came out of your own heart. You had been thinking of the words I said to you, that everyone would dislike you but myself. I am glad that you have had this dream, for it shows me that my words have sunk into my little girl's heart, and I hope now that she will try to improve. I will try, said Linda, and she did try, and whenever she was inclined to do any selfish act, she thought of her wonderful dream, and said to herself, I should not wish all the world to be like the cats and the carrots. That's a good story, said Mary Frances to the Queen. I shall try to remember it. It is a good story, 
replied the queen, smiling. But we have still better, as you shall hear. Here a page boy who sat on a stool at the foot of the story lady began to fidget, as if to ask a question. Well, what is it, Roland? asked the story lady. If you please, can't we have a story about a boy? answered Roland. Yes, said the story lady. You shall have two stories, one about a tiger and the other about a page boy who killed a dragon. End of section 14 Recording by Emma Charlotte Section 15 of the Mary Frances Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mary Frances Storybook by Jane Eyre Fryer. The Brahmin, the Tiger, and the Jackal. Once upon a time, a Brahmin, who was walking along the road, came upon an iron cage in which some men had shut up a great tiger. As the Brahmin passed by, the tiger called out, O oh, brother Brahmin, brother Brahmin, have pity on me, and let me out for only one minute. I am so thirsty, I shall die unless I can have a drink of water. I am afraid, said the Brahmin, that if I let you out, you will eat me. No, indeed, said the tiger. As soon as I have had some water, I will go back to my cage. Then the Brahmin was sorry for the thirsty beast, and opened the cage door. Instantly the tiger jumped out and cried, I will eat you first and drink the water afterwards. Do not be in such a hurry, said the Brahmin. Let us ask the opinions of six, and if they all say it is fair for you to kill me, then I am willing to die. Very well, said the tiger. We will ask the first six living things we meet. So they walked on till they came to a banyan tree, and the Brahmin said, Banyan tree, banyan tree, hear and judge. Let me hear, said the banyan tree. This tiger, said the Brahmin, begged me to let him out of his cage to drink a little water, and he promised not to hurt me. Now that he is free, he wishes to eat me. Is it fair that he should do so? Then the banyan tree said, Men come to rest in my cool shade. When they have rested, they break my branches and scatter my leaves. They are a cruel race. Let the tiger eat the man. Tiger, tiger, said the Brahmin, do not eat me yet. You said that you would hear the judgment of six. Very well, said the tiger, and they went on their way. Soon they met a camel. Camel, camel, cried the Brahmin, hear and judge. Let me hear, said the camel. Then the Brahmin told his story. When I was young and strong and could work, my master took good care of me, said the camel. But now that I am old, he starves me and beats me without mercy. Men are a cruel race. Let the tiger eat the man. The tiger would have killed the Brahmin then and there, but he said, Tiger, tiger, do not eat me yet. You said that you would hear the judgment of six. Very well, said the tiger, and they went on their way. Soon they saw an ox lying near the road. Brother ox, brother ox, cried the Brahmin, hear and judge. Let me hear, said the ox, and the Brahmin told his story. When I was young, said the ox, my master was kind to me. Now that I am too old to work, he has left me here to die. Men are a cruel race. Let the tiger eat the man. They next saw an eagle flying through the air, and the Brahmin cried, O oh, eagle, great eagle, hear and judge. Let me hear, said the eagle. The Brahmin told his story, and the eagle said, Whenever men see me, they try to shoot me. They climb the rocks to my nest and steal away my little ones. Men are a cruel race. Let the tiger eat the man. Then the tiger began to roar, but the Brahmin said, Wait, we have yet two to ask. 
soon they saw an alligator and the brahmin told his story but the alligator said whenever i put my nose out of the water men torment me they are a cruel race let the tiger eat the man the brahmin was now in despair but the tiger was willing to keep his word and the sixth judge was a jackal now the jackal is a miserable little beast whom no one likes but he listened to the brahmin's story you must show me just where it was and how it happened said the jackal so they all went back to the cage i was here said the brahmin standing in the road and i was in the cage said the tiger which way were you looking said the jackal and show me the side of the cage where you stood i was on this side said the tiger jumping into the cage oh yes i see said the jackal and was the cage jaw shut shut and bolted said the brahmin then shut and bolted said the jackal when the brahmin had done this the jackal said o oh, wicked and ungrateful tiger you would have killed the good brahmin who opened your cage door your cruelty shall be punished for no one will ever let you out again go your way friend brahmin and go in peace good for the jackal said roland clapping his hands now for the dragon so the story lady went right on end of section fifteen number sixteen of the mary frances storybook this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Lawley The Red Dragon There lived in a marsh near a certain village a red dragon which terrorized all the people round about. So the king of the country offered a great reward to anyone who would kill the frightful beast. A great many knights of the king's army went out one after the other to slay it, and each came back with a wonderful tale of how it had fought with the dragon, and after wounding it had given up the fight only for fear of being slain by the monster. Never mind, you will have better success next time, the kind king would say to each defeated knight. Then he would give him a valuable gift as a reward for his brave effort. There was among the king's pages a little boy who was a great butterfly hunter. The king's librarian prayed him a gold piece for every new butterfly he found. This page was a great favorite of the king, and often rode with him on long journeys. One day, when the king stopped in the neighborhood in which the dragon lived, the page boy slipped off with his net to hunt butterflies, and, in chasing a rare specimen, lost his way and wandered into the very swamp where the dragon was roaming about when the fierce old dragon saw the boy he came rushing and roaring at him in a great rage the frightened boy looked around there were no trees to climb for safety and he knew that if he ran he could not escape for run as he might the dragon could run still faster he had nothing with which to fight except his butterfly net. The net was fastened to the end of a long stout stick, and the boy decided to defend himself with this as best he could. When the monster charged down upon him, bellowing fearfully, he raised his stick and thrust it with all his might into the bulging side of the beast. Wow! streaked the dragon and with a puff it went up in the air and burst, just as a balloon does when a hole is slashed in its cover. When he was sure it was quite dead, the boy grasped the empty dragon skin by its spiked tail and dragged it back to the castle and showed it to the king. He was the maddest king you ever heard of when he saw the dead dragon lying there and sent off at once for the bold knights who had pretended to fight it so bravely. You old humbugs, he cried. There lies the red dragon you bragged so much about fighting. It wasn't a thing but skin and air. If any one of you had so much as touched it with the point of a sword, it would have gone to pieces, as it did when my brave page boy 
struck it with his butterfly net. The cowardly knights had no word to say, so the king ordered them to give the gifts they had received for fighting the dragon to the page boy, who was then so rich that he was able to buy a castle of his own. When he grew up, he was known as one of the bravest knights of that country. End of section 16 Recording by Alan Lawley Section 17 of the Mary Frances Storybook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mary Frances Storybook by Jane Eyre Fryer Two Poems The page was pretty brave, said Roland. When I was little, I used to be scared of the dark and my mother taught me a poem about being brave. "'Oh, say it for us, please,' cried a girl near him. The boy shook his head in refusal, but Mary Frances gave him a smile and said encouragingly, "'Please, I want to hear it.' Then Roland rose, made a bow, and recited his poem. "'If I could crow. Sometimes I waken up at night and cannot see a speck of light, I snuggle down into my bed and pull the clothes in overhead. I look and peer into the dark as something seems to whisper, hark. Then with an awful sudden jump my heart begins to thump and thump. Oh my, I think I'll be so brave and all my courage try to save. Then as I feel my courage go our yellow rooster starts to crow. Then I am ashamed and feel so small to think that I'm not brave at all, to know that in the black, black night our rooster crows, no soul in sight. He flaps his wings and crows for fair, his voice sounds like he didn't care. Oh well, what if I'm scared, I know, I'd be brave too if I could crow. Just at this point the cat came bouncing into the midst, I have just enough time, he said breathlessly. If you are quite ready, I will begin. You should have heard the children shout. We are quite ready. Go on, puss, begin, please, they cried. So the cat made a bow, twirled his whiskers, and began. The Twins There were two little kittens, a black and a grey, and Grandmother said with a frown, It never will do to keep them both. The black one we better drown. Don't cry, my dear, to tiny Bess. One kitten's enough to keep. Now run for nurse, for tis growing late, and time you were fast asleep. The morrow dawned, and rosy and sweet came little Bess from her nap. The nurse said, Go into mother's room and look in grandmother's lap. Come here, said grandmother with a smile, from the rocking chair where she sat. God has sent you two little brothers. Now, what do you think of that? Bess looked at the babies a moment, with their wee heads yellow and brown, and then to Grandmother soberly said, Which one are you going to drown? As soon as he had finished, he waltzed around three times, turned a somersault, and bounded out of the circle as quickly as he had appeared. When the story people had stopped laughing, the story king rose and waved his hand and said, That will do for today. We must not tire our guest. Oh, I am not tired, said Mary Frances. I could listen to such stories for ever. Dear child, I believe you love stories as much as we do, said the queen, smiling at her enthusiasm. Well, you shall have a delightful surprise tomorrow. While the stories were being told, Mary Frances had noticed a little dried-up man sitting at a table near the story lady, and writing rapidly with an immense quill pen. Before him was a pile of white paper and an inkwell. As she told the story, he wrote it down, keeping even pace with her words. Mary Frances had never seen anyone write so fast, and she watched him, fascinated. Almost without an effort, his pen flew over the paper, and as the last word of the story left the story lady's lips, his pen stopped. 
Then he folded his papers neatly and laid them on the table. As Mary Frances was passing out with the story lady, this little man, much to her surprise, stepped up and handed her the papers he had been writing. These, said he, are your copies of the stories you have just heard. Oh, thank you, thank you, she replied, hesitating to take them. Yes, they are for you, said the story lady. This is the ready writer. He will give you copies of all the stories you hear. Oh, thank you, said Mary Frances again to the ready writer. How fast you write. You must be the fastest writer in the world. The little man bowed and retired, evidently much pleased with her praise of his skill. End of section 17